<laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome in. We are all so excited to have you guys join us for our first workshop of Plumbing Presents um, Summer Content Camp. Uh, this is our fourth iteration of Plumbly Presents. We started about a year ago, so we are so excited that we can give you another workshop series to help you create your content, uh, create your content strategy, kind of figure out how to do all of your social marketing. Um, as we are all joining the workshop, please go to the little chat box down the bottom. Make sure it's to all attendees and to panelists and let us know where you're joining in from today. I know Jillian is in Paris. I'm here in Austin, so we're all over the world. <laughs> that was so cool. South Africa, a few Austins, awesome. I see some Canadians in there too, my homeland. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you all for taking the time out of your day to join us, whether it's evening, nighttime, daytime, morning. Um, I know that this workshop will be great to get you all started on your content strategy. So I'm Sarah. I am the brand partnerships coordinator here at Planly. And today we are going to be working with Jillian Frazier, the founder of Dialogue New York, um, as she tells us all of her tips and tricks on content strategy, working with your audience and creating a community that your followers want to be a part of. So if this is your first time with Planly, welcome. I'm so excited that you have found us. We started as the first Instagram planning um, platform and now we have grown and we do Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, all of those. So we're really here to help you manage all of your social marketing. Um, I know my favorite tool on our platform is our integrated social calendar. So that tells me all of the upcoming holidays, all of the upcoming planning workshops so I can make sure to plan my content around those holidays that are coming up. So if you have never used Planly before, um, we will be putting a discount code in the chat box and also emailing it to y'all afterwards for 100% off your first month of Planly. So we all hope that y'all can try it out, use it, enjoy it, um, and try all of Julianne's tips on your new content strategy. So a few things before we get started. Um, I see a lot of y'all are still dropping where you're in, uh, joining in from in the chat box. So thank you so much. Um, as we get the workshop started, if we could keep that chat box for um, comments on the workshop and everything like that, that would be incredible. If you want to network and connect with everyone that's joining the workshop, make sure to go to our Facebook group today um, and we'll have a thread so that you can all connect there. We're excited to see um, all of y'all's Instagrams and businesses. Also, after the workshop, we will be having a Q&A session. So there's going to be a little Q&A box next to the chat box. Make sure to put any questions that you'll have into that Q&A box and we will get to those after the workshop. Awesome. Well, I think we have a lot of people ready to go. Julianne, are you ready? I'm ready. Awesome. <laughs> well, I'll let you kick it off with the workshop. Perfect. Amazing. And if you wouldn't mind, Sarah, just to share the presentation, we'll, we'll start there. But hi, everyone. Um, so, so wonderful to have you all here today. Uh, really excited to chat with you about uh, the foundations of creating a social media and digital strategy. Um, just to provide you a little bit of context to start off, I would love to share just a little bit about my background uh, and my company, Dialogue New York. So, um, so if you want to head to the second page, we can kind of start there. So um, to start off with a little bit of context on myself, I fell into the world of social media marketing almost a decade ago, right around the time that Instagram launched. And as you can imagine, um, the industry has immensely changed. Um, it has really, really evolved. And there are various new platforms, new strategies, and it's become far more sophisticated um, than when it first started off. But I began my career um, as a social media coordinator for uh, Ian Traeger Hotels, which at the time was known as Morgan Ho Morgan's Hotel Group. And they were the first boutique hotel, um, really incredible brands. If you've heard of the Delano um, in Miami or Mondrian, Hudson, and uh, I was tasked at the time to really establish and launch um, their hotel brands on social media. So um, it was an amazing experience at the time. I had the opportunity to really test and learn and try um, a number of, of different um, strategies and approaches. Um, and, you know, also learn a lot about digital marketing as a whole and sort of how it, you know, really overlaps from 
helping to launch an online magazine, to supporting um, advertising strategies, to developing email marketing strategies, um, SEO, SEM. That's really where I began. Um, and it was, it was a really you know, amazing company to um, learn from. And then from there, I moved to Lacoste. I wanted to merge my passion for both um, you know, sport and fashion and um, work at a little bit more of a global scale. So it was my first foray in working with the team's headquarters in Paris, um, and which really served me well as many of our clients at Dialogue are now um, Paris-based. So uh, it was a great opportunity to really um, test and try and learn again uh, with digital marketing. I was managing the social media channels um, in North America. Um, again, helping with their um, online um, digital content strategy and also starting to really build out an influence marketing strategy for the brand that involved both macro influencer experiences um, and micro influencer events as well. Uh, after that, I joined a startup incubator that really specialized in growing Series A, Series B startups based in New York. And I helped to grow some of these New York startup dark companies like uh, Cara Vitamins, Capsule Pharmacy, M. Jemmy Plated, um, laying the foundation of their um, strategy and, and really helping them accelerate and grow through mainly partnerships and influence marketing. And then fast forward to today, um, it's been nearly four years since I've launched Dialogue. And really, I, I found an opportunity in the marketplace uh, where it's what I lovingly call sort of the wild, wild west of influence marketing, that there's so many various approaches to it. And um, from my experience and, and time in the industry, I found that, you know, we've kind of take a hybrid approach of, of all the different um, angles and ways to build out an influencer strategy. So all this to say that um, there's lots for us to talk about today. Um, I definitely come from an eclectic background of, of tapping into various elements of a brand's digital marketing strategy. But um, for the purpose of today's chat, I'm really excited to kind of head back to the roots and, and talk through the foundation um, and what it takes to, to build a social and digital strategy. Um, so Sarah, if you wanna just click ahead to the next page, um, this is my bio, if you're curious and reading more, and you can head to the next page. Um, here are just a handful of Dialogues uh, clients. So currently, over the past four years, we've worked with a number of different brands in the um, fashion and beauty and lifestyle, um, health, wellness, home decor, and cooking uh, brands. So um, a mix of, you know, Shiseido and specifically Clé de Peau Brute from the um, corporate end of things to helping Sakara Life grow. Um, Little Spoon has been a client, a baby food brand based in, in New York for four years, seed probiotics. So a really um, wide variety, but as, uh, as, a, as a base across all of the brands that we work with, both established or you know, early stage startup, we always really take um, a similar approach. So we'll talk through that a little bit um, uh, as it relates to influence marketing, how that ties into your social strategy a little bit later on. Certainly feel free to reach out if you have other questions related to that element of your strategy. But um, for today, we can skip ahead to the next slide. Um, we're crafting a social media strategy. So I'm really excited to see all the many, many, uh, you know, diverse people who are, are joining in today from all around the world, different corners of the world. Um, very exciting to see. And, and I think that's just such an indication of social media and how um, diverse and, and uh, wide reaching it's become. So many brands now can build these global campaigns um, in all corners of the world. And really uh, what I've found is that no matter if you are a brand establishing a content strategy to really amplify um, and bring to light your brand awareness, or if you're a creator or an influencer, regardless of the purpose of your social channels, um, the fundamental approach and foundation really remains the same. So we're going to walk through that today. Um, and Sarah, we'll start off with uh, the first slide, and that is to identify your content pillars. So um, when establishing a social and digital strategy, 
um, the first element and the first step that I recommend is really to recognize what it is that you want to be talking about. And so you'll often hear, and Planoly is the perfect example of content calendars and planning out content for your various channels. But I think before you dive into the specifics on that, it's really important to understand what are the various pillars that you want to speak about? So this can come to light uh, as a brand. If you are looking to share, um, for example, elements about your product, um, a second pillar about your founding story and your team, a third pillar about your brand and its ethos and your values, those pillars are really important to develop up front um, because it will really guide the structure of your, your sharing. Um, and likewise, if you are a influencer and you're developing your content pillars, um, there's, for example, you may be interested in travel and fashion and food and culinary. So those might be your pillars. Or if you are an influencer who has expertise in one specific niche, there's still ways that you can um, really diversify and your content ensure that you are keeping it fresh and um, and or nicely organized. So step one is really identify these pillars and it's usually between four to five uh, for a brand. And this helps you create what I like to call sticky content. So you might've heard consistent um, content franchises. And what this means is when a brand is speaking about the same campaign week over week or once a month, you start to develop sticky content that people come back for. Um, so you know, that there'll be a new um, YouTube video specific to this theme shared every month. And it's a way to, this consistency, consistency helps you to develop an audience that um, really continues to come back um, and build loyalty. And also it's a nice way to ensure that you are sharing a diverse uh, amount of content and like, not repeating yourself over and over. So if you're an influencer, for example, and you're sharing a beauty tutorial and you share three in a row, um, you might start to have, you know, audience fatigue and drop off. And so that's a nice way for you to ensure that you have that balance um, and freshness to, to keep your audience engaged. Um, we can head to the next slide. So the next um, theme is really around um, getting to know your audience. And really this is marketing 101 across the board, regardless if you are developing a strategy for social media, for, um, for your email marketing, for your SEO, for events, for PR, regardless of what it is, you really have to understand and know your audience. And that goes beyond the metrics that Instagram provides, for example. So we like to think of it sort of as a checklist in recognizing, okay, so what are the demographics and psychographics of your target audience? Um, where, how old are they? Where are they based? Um, what would be their household income? Um, what are their value set? What do they believe in? What is really important to them? Um, what are their interests and what categories really pique their interest? And also, you know, level of engagement and whatnot. So when you start to really analyze this, you can start to develop a profile of an individual that you're speaking to. And it helps you kind of ladder back up to your content pillars, ensuring that you're offering value to your audience. I can't stress enough that um, so many, you know, creatives or brands share just to share um, and really what the goal is in developing a strong digital and social strategy is to offer value to your audience. So when you can understand um, how old they are, maybe that will indicate what platform makes most sense. If you're looking to tap into boomer influencers, maybe you should look to Facebook Live. If you're you know, looking for Gen Z influencers, perhaps TikTok is the right platform. Um, you know, male influencers skew um, higher on Twitter. So understanding the various elements and defining your um, audience is really crucial to get it right and ensure that you are um, speaking to the right uh, individuals, providing them with value um, and it's relevant to them. So that's sort of the, the second um, main pillar. Um, moving on to the third. 
So determining your platform. So this goes hand in hand with what I mentioned before. So, you know, across the board, there are various, many different platforms and it is continuing to multiply, um, it seems like weekly. But um, so many brands that I speak to are eager to, right off the bat, diversify their content across all of the relevant platforms, launch a YouTube channel, you know, launch a platform, uh, an account on TikTok, be relevant on Instagram, um, be relevant on Twitter. And I think what's really crucial to ask yourself is first and foremost, where am I going to reach my target audience? Secondly, what resources are needed to create engaging content on this platform? And thirdly, what resources are needed to um, manage and engage on these platforms? Um, I really, truly believe that starting off slow and doing an excellent job on one platform and slowly uh, ramping up to a greater number of platforms is so crucial uh, because there's nothing worse than a brand that launches on a platform and then doesn't produce content or isn't responding to questions or isn't involved in whatsoever. So identifying what those platforms are and really mapping out a launch plan as to what time you will be launching on each is really crucial. Um, and so if you go to the next page, um, we kind of outline, you know, the, the various benefits of some of the, the, the most crucial platforms um, for a brand right now. So obviously Instagram is really primary because it has a, a, probably the most um, sophisticated capabilities for conversion. And that continues to change daily. They are just coming out with a new native um, affiliate um, service that uh, really continues to allow customers on Instagram to purchase and to check out. And so for a brand, um, you really have to understand that Instagram at its core, I remember, you know, when it just launched, it is a visual platform. This is where people are coming for inspiration, for ideas, it's a visual platform. Video content is reigning supreme on Instagram. And so if your brand is one that is highly visual, that you represent, uh, you know, your brand ethos through imagery, Instagram is really crucial. YouTube, on the other hand, um, also really ramping up in important importance. Um, and it is really interesting because YouTube allows you to dive into the details and provide long form testimonials and uh, examples of, of product usage. So YouTube is really valuable, um, not only from a creators and influencer standpoint, because they're really set up um, for, for influencers to thrive on YouTube, but also um, really important to think through the amount of production time needed on YouTube. So if you are going to commit to this platform, it, the amount of time video editing and shooting um, takes is pretty significant. And so uh, it's, it's really something that I recommend to brands secondarily for their brands, but um, really important. And then TikTok, you know, everyone is talking about TikTok. Um, it is really uh, allowing, it, it's really having a moment. It's really um, increasing in, in importance for a brand. And I think primarily, not only because um, the virality of TikTok is pretty huge, but also because it isn't yet governed by an algorithm the same way that Facebook and Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, are. And what I mean by that is um, the amount of engagement that you can receive on an Instagram post or story or reels is significantly less than the average engagement rate of content shared on TikTok. So the if brand awareness and if targeting a younger demographic of, of customers is primary for your brand, um, you can have a lot of fun and test and try in TikTok. But I always recommend to um, start off slow with any new platform, um, really get to, to understand it, learn it before diving in and investing significantly. Uh, but also very relevant for, for many, uh, many different uh, brands. And sort of the final piece when choosing platforms for your strategy is thinking about um, more, more so than ever right now, advertising is becoming crucial. And even with, um, even with COVID in the last year, 
the space is becoming very saturated and very competitive. So what's really important to think about is, um, are you able to allocate advertising dollars towards these platforms to help you grow organically? I remember um, way back when, very early in my career, it was very easy to grow rapidly and um, consistently and organically. And it was, you know, when the algorithm wasn't as sophisticated and geared towards paid advertisements. And nowadays, that's just not the case. Um, certainly organic growth is feasible and we see it all the time, but it really helps when you're starting to consider your uh, strategy in, for your brand or for yourself as a creative or influencer, um, does it make sense to allocate budget uh, behind these platforms so that you can really um, amplify that growth and you don't get stagnant and plateau, which can be pretty common, um, especially with a platform like Instagram. Um, heading to the next slide. So the next sort of principle is to own your voice. And I think this is really crucial because um, now you've understood, you know, who your audience is, what platforms make sense, what your content pillars are um, in, in order to, to, to really kind of lay that foundation. But owning your voice and developing your brand or personal voice is really crucial. So what I mean by that is, you know, are you witty and funny or are you a brand that is serious and educational? Deciding how you will speak to your community is crucial to be consistent because it's almost like a personal connection with each one of your followers. This comes through in your video content, in your captions. This comes through in your DMs, in responding to uh, customers and, and followers. And you really want to ensure that you outline the do's and don'ts that define that voice early on, because this will continue to ring true um, in the future. So Sarah, if you can head to the next page, um, I'll share a little bit of an example of what we really do with our clients. So you can really define in two pillars, we are and what we are not. And this isn't something that's universal. This is something that's very personal to you. And so understanding, you know, we are intelligent, we are authentic, we are transparent, dedicated, adventurous, all of these um, defining uh, object or adjectives are really crucial and will come out and will come to life when you're creating content and engaging with your community. Equally as important is who you are not. And, you know, it's, it's very important to identify um, that, you know, perhaps you don't want to be cheesy or expected or a preacher. Maybe you want to really just be transparent of what is important to you and your values, but be open-minded and ensure that um, the community feels inclusive. All of these aspects, uh, I really recommend you do upfront so that you can build out a voice and it really helps you start to build connections and loyalty over time when you define that voice. Um, heading to the next page. So going hand in hand with this is crafting your aesthetic. And I think this is probably the most crucial as it relates to Instagram but also certainly plays a role uh, across all platforms. And, you know, a social media platform and profile nowadays is becoming just as important, if not more important than a brand's website. So when people are learning about a product, oftentimes they are looking them up on a social media platform before they go to the website to check them out. And so that's why it's so crucial that you solidify your graphics, your color theme, your photography style, all of these aspects that are gonna tie together your aesthetic. So Sarah, if you can head to the next slide, I will kind of provide some examples of what I mean by this. So here are three case studies um, or examples that I pulled. The first is um, a friend of mine, um, Melanie launched a brand called Gia. Um, it's a non-alcoholic um, spritz cocktail. And um, she has done an amazing job at really defining 
her aesthetic. And it has this sort of Italian Riviera, um, a little bit of a nostalgic um, tie to it. And this comes through on her social channels, on her email marketing, on her packaging, all aspects of the aesthetic are consistent. And that's something really important when you're thinking of, uh, when you're thinking of your brand aesthetic, it's something that should be consistent online and off. So the way that you present your brand to the customer through um, packaging and events should be the same as what they will experience on an online platform. The second one is Glossier. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. They have this um, millennial pink um, aesthetic that rings through across all of their platforms, um, all of their packaging. They are a little bit more raw and edgy. They're not necessarily um, too polished or too perfect. They like to show, you know, the the real life um, aspects behind their brand. And um, they do a really great job at defining a strong aesthetic on their social channels. The third example is a client of ours, actually, Baboon to the Moon. It is a apparel brand, and it was founded um, by three guys, one of them being a really exceptional creative director who has defined their aesthetic. And you can see on their social that, um, you know, all of their imagery and their graphics are very unified and beautiful. So... Um, again, this is something to consider when building out your templates for Instagram stories or um, your grid using Planoly, um, being able to space out all of your upcoming content and ensuring that it has that beautiful look and aesthetic. The biggest thing to steer clear of is this doesn't necessarily mean it has to be perfect and high flash, high editorial. It just means that it needs to represent your brand and be consistent. So don't take this to think that, you know, I think a long time ago, Instagram in particular um, was really focused on um, an aesthetic and, um, and beautiful static imagery. And nowadays people really want to understand, they want that relatability. So don't take this um, at face value thinking that it all needs to be exactly, you know, brand imagery like your website, for example, but just ensure that there is consistency and you start to build up not only your brand voice, but your brand aesthetic across all of your platforms. So no matter where um, they're finding you, they know it's your brand and it's unique and it's different. Um, heading to the next page. So now you have you know, laid the foundation of your strategy. And I really recommend before diving into any of this, or even if you've already established um, some of your platforms and you've started to share content, take the time to, um, to really uh, assess all of these questions and um, assess all of these questions and answer all elements of, um, of the pillars that we just talked about. And I think there's nothing better than actually getting offline to have a creative brainstorm, whether it's with your team or with a friend or whoever it might be, to answer all of these questions. Because, you know, oftentimes we're so focused on execution and we're online um, and, you know, executing and in, in, in a rush to kind of catch up with um, the competition out there. But I think it's so important to... Um, take the time to really answer these questions to ensure you get it right. So I actually recommend get offline, take a pen and paper and answer these questions yourself. So now that you have that established, the second section is really on building a community around your social media platform. So Sarah, we can head to the next um, slide. So understanding the algorithm, um, there's a lot of discussion around around the Instagram algorithm. Um, also, you know, algorithms across the board. There's one specific to um, Twitter, obviously. There's one for YouTube. Um, so this is across the board, but I think it's really important to know that, um, that, you know, Instagram, for example, the average engagement rate on a static post is one to 2%. That used to be far higher, but nowadays the algorithm is really restricting that the average engagement rate for stories is seven to 12%. So when you're really thinking about 
um, building that engagement and getting the most amount of eyeballs on your content, don't discredit video content and stories because your average amount of individuals who are viewing your content is much higher on stories than it is on static posts. Um, and just to give you a uh, context on how that's calculated, it's your average number of um, views on your stories divided by your total Instagram following. So if you have 10,000 followers and a thousand people are viewing your stories, you have a 10% um, Instagram story engagement rate. So also important to know that um, platforms like Instagram are really promoting their new features. So it's easier to achieve higher engagement on reels, for example, right now than it is on static posts. So when, they, when platforms come out with new features, it's uh, really actually advantageous to test and try and be one of the first to use them um, because they are uh, promoting those features and um, you can really achieve a higher amount of engagement leveraging those. Um, consistent daily posting, I think this goes without saying, um, consistency is really key. And when it comes to a brand or an influencer, posting every day or five days a week is pretty crucial to build up that engagement and um, kind of crack the code when it comes to um, the algorithms. So make sure that when you're mapping out your pillar and your content calendar, you're really building this out consistently. And again, a platform like Planoly is super uh, beneficial to help you schedule that so that um, it takes some of the um, work off your plate. And, um, you know, Right now, the way to really hack organic growth is through highest level of engagement. So when um, you're looking to really grow your audience, the more that you engage with like-minded brands or um, creatives or individuals that you follow, leaving comments and likes and DMs, um, the more that you engage on the platform, the more that your platform will gain exposure. So um, community engagement is really crucial. Um, moving on to the next slide. So again, this is really reiterating, I can't stress enough, um, the importance of engagement. And I think, um, you know, so often I see that brands are eager to speak at their audience and share their knowledge and their information and their expertise and all of the details about their brand. And they focus on brand messaging. But what's most important is to build a two-way dialogue. It's really where my company name stems from, because that is what uh, develops a strong strategy. And it's about developing impactful and meaningful two-way conversations with your audience so that they are coming back for more, they're engaged and they feel a connection with you. So really try and avoid to share um, information um, solely like you would a website to be very informative and try and create conversations and get people involved. Um, heading to the next slide. Brand ambassadors. So I could talk for hours about uh, influencer marketing. Obviously, this is sort of my um, expertise and, and forte, but um, I think what is really crucial to understand when you are a brand um, engaging and developing your social and digital strategy, influencer marketing goes hand in hand and is crucial in order to um, really help you grow your audience or organically. So um, it is vital, but I really, really believe that it needs to happen in sequential order. So if you don't have a strong social uh, content pillars and a following and a great two-way dialogue and all of these important aspects um, that create your brand aura, then you're not going to, you shouldn't be reaching out to try and engage ambassadors. You have to do the work up front. And we always tell brands that, that come, that would like to work with our team um, that, you know, once a brand's um, halo effect is in place, our job becomes much, much more easier. So um, really important to lay that foundation first and foremost um, and think about uh, influencers secondarily. But what I can say about building brand ambassadors is that you know there are many um, various ways to approach this. Um, and 
you know, I've seen a lot of different tactics and many different companies within the influencer space over the years. Um, there's sort of one um, school of thought of, you know, relationship based, a lot of creative partnerships and oftentimes um, treating influencers as um, they would editors in sort of gifting and, um, and organically introducing them to the brand. And I think that's a really crucial approach and vital in order to build the foundation of your influencer strategy. But oftentimes, um, if you don't have the foundation to track and to measure um, and to drive to conversion, these campaigns can be really challenging to um, to really quantify. On the other side of the spectrum, there's a lot of performance marketing agencies that believe in, uh, you know, campaigns rooted in trackability and um, metrics, which is great. But oftentimes without a brand marketer behind the helm of these campaigns, they can um, run flat and um, be non-authentic. And you see it a lot in these sort of hashtag ad type um, partnerships. So, um, and then in the center, there's a ton of platforms that automate influence marketing. And from my experience using a lot of these platforms, um, I found that, you know, it's tricky to find the right curation of partners and the right individuals you want to work with don't necessarily want to be treated like robots getting these sort of um, generic uh, campaign opportunities. So at Dialogue, we take a hybrid approach when developing influence marketing strategies, taking sort of the most important aspects of all three of those um, strategies. And, um, you know, what I recommend to early stage brands that are just launching is to reach out and build authentic relationships um, in-house and see what you can do organically to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, and then for more established brands that are looking to build um, connections, um, it's really important to, to, to still maintain that authenticity and the importance of um, connection and relationships with your strategy. So don't lose touch when you start to allocate budget to these campaigns. Um, don't lose touch with your initial um, approach, which is to build connection and two-way dialogues with these creatives. And on the flip side, I know there's a lot of influencers joining us today as well. Um, I think what's really important from that point of view when building connections with brands, um, because we represent uh, many, many brands and, and build out um, connections and, and campaigns with influencers, is really to um, think of it as a relationship game. And I think, um, you know, nurture it along the way. So always be open to try a product and, and kind of um, see if it resonates and it fits within your lifestyle. Um, and then, you know, be, um, be open to um, attending an event and getting to know the, the brand marketers and building those connections. And then also, you know, when it comes time to, to build out paid uh, campaigns, have your metrics ready and know your strengths. So are you an amazing content creator that can provide great value to a brand in that sense of creating great assets? Or um, are you a... Uh, converter and do you know that you have the audience that converts and purchases what you recommend or are you a great brand awareness um, ally that can help you know really bring awareness to a client's brand know your strengths and come prepared with your analytics and your back-end stats and um, you know every time that I'm um, reached out by an influencer with this kind of approach um, there's no question uh, that's really your way to stand apart from the rest and um, really develop credibility so um, that's just my two cents on influencer marketing as a whole but certainly um, after this chat you guys can find me on Instagram uh, Julianne Fraser or uh, my emails at the end of this deck and would be happy to to answer questions as it relates to that um, this last slide here um, just shows a couple of case studies of what we've done with some of our clients. So uh, with Clay Depot, Poe, for example, we developed a um, one-year uh, annual ambassadorship with Ami Song, um, an amazing OG influencer, where we actually um, took her to Tokyo and Kyoto to meet um, the team and understand the research and development um, and, and really to um, 
to bring to life the culture behind what is the number one Japanese beauty brand um, and, and share that with her American audience so that we can um, build that credibility. And that trip transitioned into a stateside event. It transitioned to a holiday campaign. So this just demonstrates this really great authentic connection of someone who loved the brand first and foremost, but um, as a way to really kind of build out um, ongoing relationships with influencers. Um, a couple other examples with Daily Harvest, we helped them launch their Harvest Bowl, a brand new product. And um, in developing that strategy, we were thinking through really being thoughtful in the curation of what partners made most sense, who would be interested in this product, um, and how can we really help get the word out there and support um, the brand launch um, across the, the board. And finally, Woolrich, um, this was a New York Fashion Week campaign. The brand was interested in um, really being positioned as a high fashion Italian high quality uh, brand and looking to work with influencers attending the shows. Um, so that's an example from more of an experiential standpoint, how we help the brand really integrate um, and leverage uh, digital uh, exposure to kind of help them um, to build up that momentum. So influencer marketing can, can come to light in many, many different formats. But as I mentioned, I really highly recommend that you do your due diligence and really um, take the time to set up your social channels strongly before you tap into this world. Um, so there, uh, that really explains it. So I think that wraps up um, the kind of foundations of my recommendations and um, would be happy to answer any questions that I know that there's been a lot of questions coming through to Q&A. So Sarah, maybe I'll pass it over to you um, if you have a couple of questions from, from the group. Absolutely. That was so much information. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. And um, I know people have been taking notes. And also just remember, we will be sharing this recording afterwards. So if you missed anything, you want to revisit it, um, we will be sending that out so you can make sure to go back to the recording. So we have a few minutes to dive into some Q and A's. Um, first of all, let's see. So for someone who is just launching a new product or a new line, um, and they don't have a lot of inventory, what is one way that they can create their content strategy to where they're actually um, putting content out there, but not just promoting the same product over and over and looking like they only have one thing going? Yeah, um, so a, a brand with one SKU ultimately is sort of the question, not not multiple product SKUs. Yeah, they basically just started as a brand, so they only have a few products to promote, but they want to have strong content to share with their whole community. Yeah, I think I think what's really important to think about is um, again when when thinking about a content strategy, um, it really is about sharing many different aspects of in many different co content pillars um, that is core to your brand. So your audience isn't just interested in the benefits of your product, but they wanna know your founder's story. They wanna know the production process. They wanna know the inspiration behind the branding and the naming. They wanna know um, who's on the team and where can they find the product and why did you choose certain retailers to partner with or whatever it might look like. So. Um, I would suggest that, you know, you really take the time again to define those content pillars outside of product details. Um, and there's lots to talk about. And, and I think, you know, we work with plenty of clients that only have one SKU, but um, it's, it's just important to think of it in terms of um, really diversifying uh, the various details about your brand um, so that you keep people engaged because repetitive content about product um, you'll find drop off. So I hope that, that answers. Yeah, absolutely. And so I guess, do you think that that could relate to people who have service-based companies as well? Because I know sometimes if you don't have a specific product to share, you don't know where to go because sometimes like your service may not be very aesthetic or if it's, like able to just create content with. So like, how do, would you like approach it if you had a service-based company? Yeah, I mean, actually, I can speak about this firsthand because my company um, is service based and our social strategy and we're using Planoly actually um, to really help us um, in, in managing that. But, you know, we are a digital and influencer marketing agency and 
do people want to hear over and over um, about our clients and our work? It could get repetitive. And, and honestly, um, if you're not necessarily in the industry, that might not spark your interest. So when we built out our content pillars, we were thinking about um, what the various um, elements of of social and digital that people are interested in. So we're sharing um, what's in the news, what's buzzing about um, social media that you might not be aware of and what's trending on platforms. So I think as a service industry, it's really about digging or a service uh, brand. It's about digging into what your expertise is and what your knowledge is that you can share. Um, again, thinking outside of the core business of being a digital marketing consultancy, but what can what what do we know um, that others might not that we can offer value in? So um, I, I think even if your brand isn't necessarily as aesthetically driven, it's still important to define that aesthetic up front. And I think there's a lot that can be shared um, as a service business that um, you know can relate to your industry. So just defining content pillars in your audience, and then you're you're good to go. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I know you just mentioned content pillars and a few people have questions about that. And so I think kind of like the takeaway is just kind of thinking outside of the box. So if you are a service-based industry and something that you can talk about is something that's happening in your industry, then that can create a content pillar, you know? So I think Ordering. that's one thing that a lot of people kind of have issues with. So do you have any tips on creating content pillars besides just kind of like thinking outside of the box, or is it just kind of look at what you want to put out there and where can you reach um, your audience? Yeah, so maybe it would be helpful. Um, I can give sort of three examples. So if you're a new brand, for example, um, your content pillars might look like um, product information. So where are your ingredients sourced and how is it made? And what's the research and development process behind your, your product? Um, and if you are an influencer or a creator, um, really it's, it's a personal question of what your interests are. So do you love to travel? Maybe that's one pillar and you talk about how you um, book your flights and what your essentials are on the plane and you know so many different details within um, that one category. Um, but that's one pillar. And maybe a second pillar is fashion of where you find, you know, your best vintage finds and um, how you style a look and where you get your inspiration from and what magazines you like. And then a third pillar could be culinary and cooking, where are you eating and what recipes do you like? So um, from a brand perspective, it's looking at the various elements of the business from a, a influencer's perspective, what uh, interests you the most and what do you think your audience would love to learn about? Um, and from a service industry, like I said, our, our pillars as a service-based company um, are, you know, we have one on what's in the news. So what is um, buzzing about influencer and digital marketing that you might not be aware of? What are the new platform updates? Um, what are the new algorithm changes? Um, what companies are doing amazing things on um, TikTok and how can you gain inspiration? So that's one pillar of in the news. And another pillar is um, um, creatives that inspire us. So we work with influencers, we work with um, artists, we work with photographers. So each week we are gonna feature different um, collaborators that we work with and why we find them interesting and how we work with them and what makes them unique. So that's just an example from a service-based company like mine. Um, Oh no. Okay, so it looks like we lost Julianne, but no worries on that. Um, we have over 94 questions to ask um, in our Q&A, but no worries, she will be on our Facebook page to answer any questions. And then also um, we will be sending out her contact info. So if you wanna reach out to her on her Instagram and ask any other questions, feel free to do that. Um, we are so excited that you're able to join our workshop today, and we have four more workshops coming up in these next four weeks, all about creating scrappy content, how to edit your photos, um, how to do reels, how to write your captions, everything that you're going to need to know for your content strategy um, for your Instagram and all of your other platforms that you choose. So I hope you all have a great day. Make sure to look out for the email for the recording and make sure to attend our workshops in the future. Have a great day.